In 1939, Werner Heisenberg went on a trip to America for a physics symposium. Nuclear scientist Enrico Fermi's wife asked him, anyone must be crazy to stay in Germany. To which Heisenberg replied, Germany needs me. A few months later, Hitler attacked Poland and started the Second World War. In the fall of 1941, Heisenberg again went to Nazi-occupied Denmark. There he met none other than Niels Bohr himself. What these two discussed is one of the biggest mysteries. No one knows precisely what was discussed at this meeting held at Bohr's home, with only Bohr's wife, Magreta, present, but afterwards, Bohr was visibly shaken and distressed. These two events put Heisenberg in a very weird position in history. During the Second World War, Heisenberg was the top physicist Nazi Germany had, and it was clear to all that he would be involved in the atomic bomb project. But why would he work for the Nazi? He was not an obvious anti-Semite. In fact, his own mentor Max Born was Jewish. And when the Nazis came to power in 1933, many of Heisenberg's colleagues, including Einstein, Born, Pauli, Schrödinger, etc., fled because they were Jewish or opposed to Nazism. Even Heisenberg himself was labelled as a white Jew. So, to understand Heisenberg, we have to look at how he rose to the top of German science that got labelled Jewish science during the Nazi regime. Became the star of theoretical physics at an extremely young age. At Göttingen University, he had developed matrix quantum mechanics, together with his professor, Max Born, and a fellow student, Pasquale Jordan. While matrix is used everywhere these days, it was a new topic at the time. Even Heisenberg complained that he didn't even know what a matrix was, but he quickly learned it. Experimentally observable quantities, both the frequencies and these amplitudes but should forget about the motion of electrons in orbits. Then he discussed just how these quantities, Q and P, K, N, should occur in the theory. How would you form kinetic and potential energy from them? And he found that these uh, quantities obeyed very strange multiplication rules which he had never seen before. But he wrote down these multiplication rules. Uh, P and Q just did not uh, behave like ordinary algebraic quantities. When he came home to Göttingen, uh, Max Born told him, but Heisenberg, what you have there is simply the multiplication of matrices. Now you all learn about matrices probably in your freshman year or uh, at most in your sophomore year, but Heisenberg had never heard about matrices. Then, some months later, a 39-year-old Austrian named Schrödinger published quantum wave mechanics, partly because he was disgusted with the matrix approach. Threatened, Heisenberg wrote his colleague Wolfgang Pauli, the more I reflect on Schrodinger's theory, the more disgusting I find it. I consider it to be crap. Turns out both Heisenberg's matrix approach and Schrodinger's wave approach are mathematically equivalent. However, for a while there were two different camps. One led by Schrodinger, Einstein, and Planck. Meanwhile, the other camp led by figures such as Bohr, Heisenberg, Pauli, and Born, which we call today as Copenhagen approach. Interestingly, it is a fashion these days to diss on the Copenhagen approach. With the success of quantum mechanics, Heisenberg rose to fame. In 1928, by age 26, he was so famous that he was appointed a full professor and the head of the physics department at the University of Leipzig. In 1933, he was awarded the Nobel Prize for his contribution to quantum mechanics. In 1932, Adolf Hitler became the Chancellor of Germany despite receiving only 37% of the vote, largely because other political leaders feared the rise of the communists. After the Reichstag fire in February 1933, which was blamed on the communists, Germany declared martial law. By March, Hitler had secured the power to pass laws without parliamentary approval. Hitler immediately used his power to make life miserable for his Jewish subjects. And on 7th of April, he enacted a law that all communists and Jewish people had to be fired, with the exception of World War I veterans. 
This meant Jewish doctors, lawyers, musicians, and most importantly to Heisenberg, university professors, including his mentor, Max Born, would be fired. When Heisenberg learned that Max Planck had personally met with Hitler, he wrote to Born, Planck has spoken with Hitler and received the assurance that the government will do nothing beyond the new law. I would ask you not to make any decisions yet, but wait and see how our country looks in the fall. Born agreed to wait, but within a month, Wolfgang Pauli, himself of Jewish background but based in Switzerland, found Born a position at Cambridge. Realizing that Hitler would not be removed from power, Born decided to leave Germany. Around the same time, Heisenberg's rival, Erwin Schrödinger, who was not Jewish, also departed for England in silent protest against the Nazi regime. This left Heisenberg as the most important theoretical physicist left in Germany. However, all is not well for Heisenberg. By the spring of 1934, Johannes Stark became the chair of the German Research Foundation. He was a very early promoter of Hitler and was an obsessive anti-Semite. You might know him for his debate against Einstein, who himself was of Jewish background. As his first action, Stark ceased research funding for all theoretical work and even restricted what experimental work got funded to Aryan topics. Basically, Stark labelled theoretical physics, such as relativity or quantum mechanics, as a Jewish science and tried to ban it in Germany. Heisenberg wasn't fired, but he became the focus of more and more vitriol, especially from Johannes Stark. On the 15th of July, 1937, Stark published a full-page article titled White Jews in Science that called Heisenberg and, for good measure, Max Planck and Arnold Sommerfeld, bacterial carriers of the Jewish spirit who must be eliminated just as the Jews themselves. Heisenberg fought back, appealing directly to Heinrich Himmler to clear his name. Yes, that Heinrich Himmler, Hitler's number two guy, and according to Wikipedia, one of the most powerful men in Nazi Germany, and a main architect of the Holocaust. Himmler eventually supported Heisenberg, partly because Heisenberg's mother knew Himmler's mother, a strange example of social connections in the Nazi bureaucracy. In July of 1938, Heisenberg heard the good news that Himmler would support Heisenberg as long as Heisenberg didn't get too political, and quantum mechanics and relativity could be taught in school. It was a seeming victory for Heisenberg, who now had a powerful ally in Himmler himself. He would support the regime no matter what, as long as he was a first-class citizen and was allowed to study theoretical physics. Heisenberg felt he had to ignore politics in order to save German science and decided not to worry about the moral implications of working for the Nazis or the ramifications of his scientific research. Very soon, Heisenberg's new morality was put to the test as anti-Semitic violence exploded all over Germany. Now, finally, we get to nuclear fission. On the 6th of January 1939, the German chemist Otto Hahn and his assistant published their startling results that when uranium was bombarded with slow neutrons, sometimes the heavy uranium nuclear split in what is called nuclear fission. By March 1939, Frederick Joliot and his wife, Irene Curie, daughter of Marie Curie, published that nuclear fission produced more neutrons than it absorbed and therefore could cause uranium to have other nuclear reactions in a chain reaction. Although it still seemed unlikely, a nuclear bomb was possible. By the end of April, the New York Times was saying, scientists say that a bit of uranium could wreck New York. Just a few weeks later, Heisenberg went on a trip to America for a cosmic ray symposium. Everywhere he went, everyone wanted to know why was he still staying in Germany. People knew he was not anti-Semite, as his own mentor, Max Born, was Jewish. Nuclear scientists, Enrico Fermi's wife, Laura, asked him, anyone must be crazy to stay in Germany. For which Heisenberg replied with, Germany needs me. Heisenberg must have read the New York Times article, and he had a theory that whoever possessed this first could blackmail the whole world. A month later, he returned on a nearly empty boat to Germany, and the month after that, in September 1939, Hitler attacked Poland and started World War II. Heisenberg was called to Berlin, and in Berlin, he was asked to join the Uranium Club by his former student, Karl Friedrich von Weizsäcker. After the war, Weizsäcker said that Heisenberg wasn't that hard to convince, for Heisenberg thought Hitler would fail soon. However, Hitler was far more successful than Heisenberg expected. 
and within nine months, Germany had overrun Belgium, the Netherlands, and Luxembourg, and signed an armistice with France. Meanwhile, Heisenberg kept working on nuclear research and even complained about the lack of funding for it. Heisenberg's actions weren't a secret. Everyone knew that Heisenberg was working on nuclear research. In fact, the head of the department to investigate enemy research said, no one but Professor Werner Heisenberg could be the brains of a German uranium project. Every physicist in the world knew that. And when Heisenberg was captured in 1945, they labelled him as the leader of the German atomic weapons program. And it was the fear of Heisenberg in particular that inspired so many scientists and politicians to devote so much money and time to the development of the nuclear bomb. This brings us to the final part of the video. How should one consider the moral and ethical values of their scientific pursuit? Oppenheimer kind of shrugged it by quoting the verse of Gita, I have become death. Heisenberg's case is slightly different because the Nazi didn't have a working atomic bomb. Some consider Heisenberg a patriotic scientist trying to save Western values at any cost. Some think Heisenberg was a naive opportunist trying to protect science from politics. While a more popular theory is that Heisenberg deliberately sabotaged the Nazi atomic weapon project, most historian now thinks that it is too generous. Give your opinions in the comment section. If you enjoyed the video, don't forget to boop the like button or even consider subscribing. Thank you for watching till the end.